r slash no sleep posted by you slash born beach if you see a woman with a serrated smile you need to read this as a matter of life and death final he puts his face in his hands and his shoulders quake with silent sobs a minute passes it appears we've reached the end of his account a harrowing experience i say giving my notes a final swipe with a pencil i straighten up in my chair flattening the front of my jacket and reaching out to shake his hand on behalf of the facility i'd like to thank you for taking the time to share it with us his sobs taper off and he's quiet for a moment then he looks up from his hands and his eyes are red and his voice is shaking it's not over he says there's more i pull back my handshake my apologies something else occurred yes he says the next few hours turned into a nightmare i settle back into my chair Already there's plenty of details that indicate the presence of Jagged Janus on that sleepy island, but I could always use more. The man clears his throat, and I listen intently as he resumes his account. It takes 10 minutes for me to muster the courage to crack the bathroom door. I do it gently. Quietly. You can hardly hear the shitty hinges creak, that's how careful I am. I peer out of the crack, looking for the smiling woman, terrified that I'm going to see her standing in the living area waiting for me, but I don't. Nobody else is in the cabin. It's just me. So I step out, across the hardwood floor. It creaks and groans with each step I take, and each time it does my heart skips a beat and I expect to see her jump out of the darkness. He shudders. I'm seeing that smile everywhere now. In every shadow, in every window. I want to shout and scream, I want to call out to my friends and beg them to pull me out of this horror, but they're beyond the cabin door, out there at the far end of the yard. They're a world away. Just a moment. I say, placing the clipboard down. You never thought to use your phone to call for help? Weren't you listening? He says. I was on a backwater island off the coast of rural BC. I didn't even have spotty service. There was nothing. My phone was a glorified fucking flashlight. Thank you for clarifying. I mark on my clipboard to investigate the service signal in the area. If it turns out that there is cellular service, then it's possible he's lied about other aspects of his account. A disappointing prospect. Continue. Our tents are in the far end of the yard, so I'm psyching myself up to book it out of the front door. I've got my hand on the knob and I'm ready to fling it open and scream bloody murder, and that's when I hear it. His fingers throw on the metal desk. Tap. 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 I look at the window beside the front door, and I see a long arm, in a frayed sleeve with crooked fingers playing against the glass. They're drumming a melody, but it's discordant. Strange. It's not music, but more like. Noise masquerading his song. He drops his burnt cigarette into the ashtray and reaches for another. I hear her voice again. I see you, she says, in this gravelly, guttural voice. The tapping gets faster, heavier. I pull away from the front door, and fall back to the shadows of the cabin. He lights the smoke and brings it to his lips, then pauses. I see her head crane down to the window. Her eyes gleam in the moonlight, darting around, swiveling in ways they shouldn't be able to. She's searching again. For something. For me, maybe. I don't know. He pulls on the cigarette, coughing as he spits out a lungful of smoke. I slide the glass of water across the table toward him, and he picks it up and slams the entire thing. When he's finished, he wipes some wetness from his chin and continues. Then, she's gone. Again? I ask, mildly exasperated. There was no part of Janice's legend that indicated her vanishing. He nods. I'm alone. And time passes. Minutes. Maybe hours. He shakes his head. I just sit there in the living room, my ears and eyes straining for any sound, any movement, anything. I'm trembling and breathing in short bursts, terrified if I breathe too much or too heavily she'll hear me. I wonder how long it's been. I wonder how long until morning comes, and somebody wakes up and comes to check on me or use the washroom. I think about using my phone to check the time, but the idea of its backlight revealing my position terrifies me so I don't. I leave it be and I sit there a while longer. I make several notations on my clipboard. Terror. Inability to move. Shadows. I circle the words with a sigh. Sleep paralysis? I look up at him, wondering how likely it is that this whole experience may be nothing more than a bad dream. Still, the possibility of it being a true account is too valuable to ignore. So then, did you wait until the morning? He laughs. Another drag. Fuck no, he says. It took a while, but eventually I had enough. I got calmer, or maybe just more desperate. I don't know. 
Maybe I just needed to know that my nightmare had an ending. I make a mark on my form indicating him referencing the experience as a nightmare. Beside it, I scrawl the words confession, sleep paralysis. So, did you check your phone then? Yeah. He gnaws at his fingernail. A nervous response, often correlated with lying but not necessarily. I'm quivering as I pull the phone from my pocket. My finger presses the power button, and my home screen comes to life. It's a stupid sonic background, and it bathes my face in a blue glow. What time was it? It was 3.34 am, about 2 hours from sunrise. He takes a breath, long and deep. So I put my phone back in my pocket, deciding that I can't wait another 2 hours. I need to do something now, before that woman comes back. I tell myself to make a run for it. First though, I need to wake up my friends. I don't want to make myself an easy target, so I open my mouth to scream, to scream and run headlong out the cabin door and toward the tents and maybe make it out of there alive and. He pauses, tears coming down his face. He's whimpering now. I tap my pencil rhythmically on the clipboard, my impatience getting the better of me. And? And a hand, long and crooked, wraps itself around my mouth. Something pulls my head back, and I smell rotten decay, and a voice whispers in my ear. I see you. I raise an eyebrow. But you got away? He shrugs, ashing his cigarette in the glass tray. Guess so. I blacked out. When I woke up, it was in a hospital bed surrounded by my friends. The ones from the cabin? Yeah. I check the box labeled survivor. I chew on the eraser of my pencil for a second, before checking one more box. Post traumatic stress affected. They're all telling me it's their fault, he says. Emily's mumbling about how we never should have come out to the cabin. Steven's talking about how he and I should never have done mushrooms that afternoon. Haley's blaming herself for dozing off and letting Steven and I get exceptionally drunk. He gives a bittersweet smile. Everybody wants a share of the guilt. One might say that they've earned it, I say, hardly masking my disappointment. It's possible that you did have a case of hallucinatory distress. I don't think so. At that point, the mushrooms had worn off hours ago. Hell, by the end of it I wasn't even still drunk. I make a note on the form indicating the subject believed themselves sober at the time of the event. You said the island was quite remote. I'm assuming the hospital wasn't local to it? No, it was off the island, an hour or so inland. The man takes a breath as though happy that the hard part is over. I must have been out for a day at least, because I don't remember traveling there. My interest peaks again. A recurring aspect of the Janus mythology is a sense of mild amnesia, as well as the presence of minor to severe bite wounds. What did the hospital treat you for? He coughs, clearing his throat. A mild concussion as well as water in my lungs. Water in your lungs? I toss my pencil down in disbelief. Seriously? He shrugs. The doctor didn't understand either. Okay. So your friends leave get well cards, you get discharged a couple days later and now you're here? I lean back in my steel chair, folding my arms. Is that pretty much it? Not exactly, he says darkly. Before they left, I mention the smiling woman to them. I sigh, leaning forward. Could you use the exact phrasing? Sure. He shifts, uncomfortable. It's when they're apologizing, taking the blame for everything. I interrupt them and ask them a question, but my voice is like sandpaper so I have to do it twice. There was this woman, I say. She was smiling in the cabin window. Did any of you see her? Stephen and Haley shake their heads. They rub my arm, they tell me I was tripping. They tell me it was a mistake to mix mushrooms and alcohol. They tell me this is their fault, all over again, like they're not listening to a word that I'm saying. But Emily's standing back. She's staring at me and her eyes are filled with something like regret. Her hands find her pockets, and she buries them and looks away. I say her name. She knows something, I can tell. She's seen the woman too, maybe. My pencil slides down the interview form, circling a word that says witness and annotating it with a small question mark. Did you confront her about this? No, he says with a sigh. She left the room too quickly. I don't think she wanted to speak about it. At least, not in front of Haley and Stephen. That night I was alone. My hospital room was cramped and silent. The only company I had was the apple tree outside my window. It took me a long time to fall asleep, but eventually I did. I settle back into my chair, folding my arms and listening. It feels as if this might be nothing more than a hallucination after all, there's simply too many departures from the mythology. I woke up to tapping. The sound of fingers on glass. 
My eyes snapped open and I stared out the window, fucking horrified, but it was just the apple tree. Some of its branches were brushing against the window and making a tapping sound. He chuckles, so I roll over to go back to sleep, wondering if this was what my life was going to be like from now on. You know, panicking every time I hear a branch on a window. Or a face in a window. That's when the door creaks open. I frown. To your hospital room? He nods. I start freaking out. My breath hitches in my chest, my body tenses, I know that this is it. The smiling woman's back for real this time. But it's only Emily. She pauses in the doorway and asks me if she can come in. I tell her of course, and she closes the door behind her. She doesn't bother turning on the lights, and as she draws closer, passing through the shafts of moonlight, I see her eyes heavy with bags, her posture slouched and the wetness of tears on her cheeks. She looks exhausted. Devastated. I'm sorry, she says, wiping snot on her sleeve. I'm sorry, I thought she was gone. So, I say, flipping back a page on my clipboard. She knew about the woman after all. I found the spot I'd annotated witness, and erased the question mark. Yeah, the man says. She said a woman attacked her brother when they were both kids. She said the memory wasn't great, because she was maybe four years old at the time, but that she remembered him being dragged backwards by his face. She said the woman was smiling the entire time and kept repeating into the sea with you, over and over again. The man pauses, his voice getting lower as he speaks. The woman held him beneath the surf until he drowned, then she let the waves take him. Disturbing. I tap the pencil thoughtfully against my chin. And she never brought this up to her parents? She did. Her father told her it was just her imagination. He said that her brother had fallen into the ocean and gotten swept away, and it was already hard enough to deal with without Emily adding to it. So Emily just buried the memory. Moved on. The man looks up at me, his expression despondent. Then, he brings a fingernail to his mouth. That's when we heard it, he says. In the hospital room. A tapping. Tap. 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 It came from the window to my right, the one with the old apple tree. Was it the woman? I don't know, he shrugs. I didn't look. I told her not to look either, Emily. I told her to just look at me. Focus on me. I didn't know what she saw as a little girl, down by the ocean, but I knew I didn't want her to see what I'd seen. He shudders. I didn't want her to see that smile. Did she listen to you? He shakes his head, slowly, unhappily. His hand grips a fistful of his own hair. She looked, and when she did, she screamed. She screamed so loud that the lights came on down the hall, and I heard the overnight nurse call out. Then Emily rushed to the window, and I still refused to look, but I heard her beating against it with her fists, clawing at it with her nails. The nurse burst in shortly after and found Emily weeping on the floor. He pulled her out of my room and got a patrol car to drive her home. The man takes a breath. He puts his face in his hands and rubs his eyes. I texted her shortly after, he says. Yes. I look at the folder on my desk labeled correspondence, and then down at the watch on my wrist. It's already more than half hour past the end of my shift. If the texts are everything that's left, I can read them on my own. I rise from the desk and offer my hand to Shag. He gives it a weak squeeze, avoiding my eyes, then leaves the room with my pack of smokes and not another word. I sigh, sitting back down in the chair. Another long day. Another dead end. I adjust my glasses and pull out the text logs. There's only one sheet with a handful of message receipts. The chance is slim, but the possibility that there's something in there about Janice entices me. The allure of having years of my personal research validated proves too much to resist. I begin to read. As I do, I make a note of the timestamps. In my experience, they often paint a picture deeper than the words. 1.34 AM Dorian, are you okay? 2.12 AM Emily, not really. 2.12 AM Dorian, did you see her? 2.45 a.m. Dorian, M, I'm sorry. That was a stupid text. 2.45 a.m. Emily, it's fine. 2.46 a.m. Dorian, I'm guessing you don't feel like talking. 2.46 a.m. Emily, actually, it might be good for me. 2.47 a.m. Dorian, yeah? Me too. 2.47 a.m. Dorian, I never got a chance to tell you earlier, I can't imagine how horrible it must have felt. 2.47 a.m. Dorian, to see what happened to your brother and have your dad not believe you? That's fucked. 2.55 AM Dorian, unsent, my bad. We don't have to talk about heavy shit if you don't want to. Did you finish your book on? 2.55 AM Emily, it's fine. 
We were never close anyway. 2.55 AM Dorian, sorry to hear. Did you ever tell your mom? 2.56 AM Emily, no. My mother was already dying by then. Dad would have killed me. 2.56 AM Dorian, fuck. I'm an asshole. How could I forget something like that? Sorry again. 2.57 AM Emily, you're not an asshole. As long as I've known you Julie hasn't been my stepmom, she's just been my mom. It's fine. 2.58 AM Emily, I'd honestly be shocked if you remembered anything about my birth mom. I mean, even I hardly do. 2.58 AM Dorian, thanks for trying to make feel like less of a dick. Appreciate it smile. 2.58 AM Emily, besides, you're right. 2.58 AM Dorian, I am? About what? 2.59 AM Emily, you're right that I would have told her about Jonas if I could have. 2.59 AM Emily, by then she was so hopped up on painkillers that I hardly recognized her though. 3 AM Dorian, the meds must have been pretty heavy. That's a lot to deal with for a 4 year old kid. 3.01 AM Emily, yeah, her esophageal cancer was bad. She was in a lot of pain near the end. Pretty sure my ass of a father was having an affair at the time too. 3.01 AM Dorian, I'm sorry. That's a shitty memory to bring up. 3.03 AM Emily, don't be. I actually wanted to thank you. It's a memory I'd forgotten. I think I repressed a lot of old memories of her. 3.04 AM Dorian, I can't tell if you're pissed or not. Are you sure you're okay? 3.04 AM Emily, yeah. 3.05 AM Emily, honest really, if it wasn't for you, I'd probably think I was going crazy right now. 3.05 AM Dorian, what? 3.06 AM Emily, I saw her too. 3.06 AM Dorian, the smiling woman? 3.07 AM Dorian, M? 3.12 AM Dorian, everything okay? 3.23 AM Dorian, who did you see? 3.34 AM Emily, I see my mother. I stare at the last word in stunned silence. Her mother? Could she actually have been the origin of the legend? I rub a hand along my jaw considering what I've heard of Emily's history. She had only been four years old at the time of her brother's death, when she witnessed a woman drag him into the sea. Could that woman have been her own mother? Unlikely, but not impossible. Children often reframe moments of terror to understand the incomprehensible. I reach for my briefcase, unclasping the latches on the front and pull out my laptop. I take a breath, and then open up the database software. Emily's easy enough to find. Her last name is plastered everywhere across her social media, so I plug that in. The search function isn't the fastest, but it does the trick. It takes 30 seconds for the tiny, rotating hourglass to stop spinning and when it does, I see her. Subject, Emily Caldwell. Father, Hank Caldwell. Mother, Janice Caldwell, deceased. I swallow, my hands shaking on the keyboard. Had I finally found jagged Janice? I pour myself a glass of water finishing it in two big gulps. It does little to calm my nerves. Still, it's one piece of the puzzle solved, but really it just creates more questions. It doesn't explain several aspects of the man's story. The water in the lungs. The vanishing. Certain pieces don't add up, at least not when compared against the original legend. I hear a knock on the door. Three sharp raps with a knuckle. I get up to answer it, thinking maybe the man's forgotten his phone, or wants to give me back my pack of smokes. When I open it though, there's nobody. I raise an eyebrow, and head back to my laptop. I need to discover the source for these changes, these departures from the Jagged Janus mythology. This time I bring up my web browser, navigating to one of my preferred resources on urban legends. The website's a bit corny, but it's proven accurate and its community aspect has been invaluable in my research. After some scrolling, I bring up the Jagged Janus article. People can leave anecdotal encounters beneath the main text, and sometimes they do. Usually they're all bullshit, and it's simple enough to tell at a glance, but sometimes. One of them catches my eye. It mentions seeing the serrated smile, the tapping fingers, and that they found their infant child dead with water in its lungs. I shake my head. Bullshit, clearly. I prayed at least the infant was still alive, or that the poster was some teenager with nothing better to do. I keep scrolling. I see more keywords. There and then gone. Voice like a meat grinder. To the sea with you. I pause. Swallowing. To the sea with you? Those were the words the man had mentioned Emily said, words she remembered when she witnessed her brother being pulled into the ocean. To the sea with you. My mind spins, but a picture is forming. The guttural, 
difficult to understand voice, the drowned brother, I see you, no, she was never saying I see you, she was saying, to the sea with you, the man couldn't understand it though, and he was in such a panic that he defaulted to the simplest phrasing, my heart races, I reach for my phone to make a call, to tell my boss what I've found, it wasn't long ago the facility had an incident with a man with a red notepad, one in which we learned the core principle of all legends, and one which cost many people their lives, that legends evolve. If the Jagajanus legend has evolved, then we need to allocate additional resources to locating it and neutralizing it. I continue to scroll, noticing many of the anecdotes have been posted in the last week. Several, in the last few days. If even half of them are true, then it'd imply highly increased activity on Janus's part. I hear another knock at the door. Three soft traps. I curse, kicking off from my desk and storming to the door, phone still pressed to my face waiting for my boss to pick up. Once more I swing it open, and once more I look down the cold, empty hallway. Nothing. I slam the door shut and stalk back to the table. My phone continues to ring, and my boss continues to ignore my call. It's really not like her, but I tell myself to relax. She's probably in the middle of supper. I check the watch on my wrist and frown. The display reads 3.34 AM, which can't be right. It was 6 o'clock only 20 minutes ago. I heave a sigh, adding broken wristwatch to my list of problems. Then, three more knocks. I have to confess that I'm getting fed up. I'm going to leave this here for now, as it appears my interviewee is having some fun at my expense. Either that, or, well, that isn't really a possibility I'd like to entertain. On second thought, I'll post this before I go. Just in case.